Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure on behalf of Kerber Foundation to welcome to our today's edition in our series, Making Peace, which we do together with the Spiegel as a partner in cooperation. Well, there, there's a famous Latin saying, and some of you might have heard of it, si vis pacem para bellum. Basically meaning, if you want peace, you have to prepare for war. So uh, the logic is quite simple. Basically, it says that you never know what the other state is up to. So maybe it's a good idea to have a strong army um, to be able to defend your country. So nobody can have any idea of attacking you. So it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Well, uh, yes and no, because there's a problem. Because uh, once you have this strong army to defend your country, the other country may be looking at your army and maybe thinks it's not such a great idea to have this great army in the other country um, and uh, perceives this army as a threat. So what is the consequence? The consequence is that this other country will probably also want to have a strong army to be able uh, to defend themselves against your army. So this is the classical security dilemma in international relations. And it has happened many times in history and we will be talking about this tonight. Well, things changed after the Second World War when a lot of nuclear weapons were uh, installed in the West and the, in the East, and basically both sides threatened each other with complete destruction. So at the time, politicians started to think, well, maybe in the East and West we should do something about this security dilemma, and we have to do something about uh, the arms race between East and West during the Cold War. And they came up with uh, a couple of treaties and agreements which basically limited um, the number of weapons to be installed in, in, both, um, in both areas, in the West and the East. Also, they came up with a treaty to uh, limit the proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons, for example, uh, on the global scale. And then finally, after a couple of decades, they even uh, came up with treaties to reduce the number of nuclear weapons. So I think it is fair to say that these efforts uh, were quite valuable efforts and they contributed to making um, uh, the world a more peaceful place, but they certainly didn't prevent the world to be 100% uh, peaceful. But that's something we will be talking about tonight. What are the historic experiences with arms control? Um, what was the role of diplomacy in negotiating these treaties? And are there any lessons to be learned for today, but also for the future? Because there are some issues that are quite challenging when you think about arms control. For example, what does arms control and non-proliferation mean uh, for the area of cyber security, of cyber war? Very difficult. Uh, Topic. Also, what does it mean when you think about autonomous weapons and automatic warfare? Or when we think about space, the weaponization of space? Or very, very topical questions, how to deal with countries like Iran or North Korea? So lots of interesting cases to be discussed today, the historical lessons, but also how we deal with these questions in the future. And uh, I'm very happy that we have uh, very good experts uh, to discuss uh, these questions with us and give us some answers. And first, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Professor Joe Maiolo, who is from the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War at King's College in London. He's really the eminent historian on arms races in the 20th century. He has published extensively on arms competitions in the 20th century, especially in the interwar period between World War I and World War II. And we are honored to welcome him here today at the Kerber Forum. Joe, it's a great pleasure to have you here. <laughs> Our second panelist, you already know, because he has been with us in this series, Making Peace from the Very Beginning, Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger. Um, he has, uh, he's the chairman of the Munich Security Conference for 10 years now. And um, 
He has been working with Kerber Foundation for many years uh, in the context of the Burgdorf Roundtable, but also developing a program, uh, a young leaders program for the Munich Security Conference. He has been in the Foreign Service for 35, 38 years. Something like that. Something like that. He don't even remember himself. <laughs> Very long time. Uh, and he has basically had every position in the Foreign Service that you can imagine, with the one exception, he was never Foreign Minister. Um, uh, Wolfgang, it's a great pleasure to have you here. <laughs> And last but not least, I would like to introduce our moderator tonight, Klaus Brinkbäumer from The Spiegel. Until very recently, he was the editor-in-chief of The Spiegel magazine. He has said farewell to his uh, staff uh, only yesterday or the day before. He has been also a long time with The Spiegel for 25 years. 25 years. Uh, Klaus, it's a great pleasure to have you here again at the Körper Forum. <laughs> As always, uh, there will be the opportunity for you to ask questions um, uh, to our panelists. And uh, with that, I would like to wish you all a very interesting evening. We invite you after the discussion for a glass of wine or beer uh, or water uh, for a small reception. And with this, I would like to ask our three gentlemen to the stage. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good evening, and I guess no other introduction is necessary, so let's get right into it. About three years ago, um, at the international conferences, like the security conference in Munich, um, there was an atmosphere that was quite different from the one we have today, because back then, the two superpowers, United States and Russia, could announce that 85% of uh, their nuclear weapons had been destroyed. It felt like an era or a phase of um, peace could, could really begin. It's very different from we have today. Can you remember what it was like three years ago? How did it feel? How was the atmosphere at the M Munich Security Conference? Well, uh, let me go back even a little further. Yeah. Uh, in 2009, remember Barack Obama was elected in 2008, 10 years ago. Um, in 2009, the American and the Russian delegations in Munich mm -hmm. uh, pushed what they called the reset button. Uh, we actually had a little button on the stage for them to push uh, especially <laughs> Joe Biden, who, Did it rep work, the who represented the, the, the uh, new uh, American administration. And part of this reset program mm -hmm. was the idea that right now should start uh, the negotiation process for what has become uh, known as the New Star Treaty. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, and I'm really proud of, of this because it doesn't happen often that at such an informal conference as the Munich Security Conference, you actually get a treaty uh, initiated and then even um, you know, confirmed, ratified. Exactly three years ago, in 2012, um, the, um, what you call the Papers of Ratification, um, the signed treaties with the seal, et cetera, et cetera, were exchanged on the stage in, in Munich by uh, actually Mrs. Clinton mm -hmm. and Sergei Lavrov. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, euphoric. Mm -hmm. We thought this is an opening for yet a, a whole series of discussions that can be conducted, not only between the Russians and the Americans, but uh, as Europeans, maybe we can talk about the future of the Arctic and make the Arctic uh, potentially a weapons-free area. Um, um, and, and many other, uh, uh, and, and many other uh, questions of how to prevent further nuclear proliferation. So the world, the opportunities seemed almost endless. But the world changed, of course, within a year or two. Uh, remember 2014, Crimea, etc. And ever yeah. since, it's been downhill. Yeah. Did you believe back then that this was the end of all arms races? 
Uh, well, no, because I started working on a book uh, <laughs> on, on arms, arms races. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, this is a typical uh, scenario where it, it, it seems like there's an opening up and, and uh, 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 there are multiple times in history, sort of the turn of the uh, 19th to the 20th century, the, the, the various Hague conferences, the advancement of legal norms and treaties to try and uh, 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 bring humanity to war. Um, the disarmament treaties of the 1920s and the World Disarmament Conference in 1932, it seemed like for a moment everything was about to open up and then it shuts down. Why does it? it um, because the process of disarmament or arms control doesn't mesh with the political order, the existing political order, and that there isn't a more fundamental agreement about what are the rules and norms between the leading military powers, their, their, their hierarchy, and, um, and what rules they observe in behavior towards each other. Mm -hmm. So often uh, it's important to contrast uh, the relatively peaceful 19th century with the extreme violence and near obliteration of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you, and historians have debated this back and forth, but I think it, most would agree that the difference is in the European context, was the concert of Europe, a basic understanding between the great powers. Uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't that there was no violence or political violence or that there was no suppression of progressive forces or, 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 or whatever, but there was no systemic great power war. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think there were many of those reset buttons that were pushed, uh, but it doesn't quite seem to work because it's hard. <laughs> 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 the button tends not to be connected to anything else. And I think you, unless there's some underlying political agreement or, sadly, uh, a, a, a military outcome, it's very difficult to fix uh, the, the, the balance of military power. So let's fast forward three years. And Barack Obama has left the stage. Donald Trump has entered the stage. And now we are talking, as you I'm sure have read, uh, about the termination of the INF contract by the United States because they claim that Russia is violating this contract. And even the START contract, the second big one, is being debated because John Bolton seems to want to cancel it. What's the meaning of these two contracts? Can you explain to our audience what they mean? The, sorry, the... INF first. Uh, well, mm. well it, it, mm. it was a whole, in 1987, mm. the, uh, uh, treaty was signed eliminating a whole category of intermediate mm -hmm. uh, uh, missiles, 500 kilometers to 5,500 or yeah. whatever. Um, sorry, but let me, let me try and Go ahead. Put, put, put that into real context. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, uh, um, IBM went, sorry, ABM treaty went in 2001, 2002. So the anti-ballistic missile treaty, which was signed in 72, was canceled by the George W. Bush administration. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the key cornerstones of nuclear disarmament. Then you've got the INF treaty, which stabilized at least the, the, the nuclear balance, and, or at least took a lot of the danger out of it. And then you have the START uh, uh, treaties that reduced the arsenals at the end of the Cold War. Well, you now have two of those. For well, one's gone, one is in danger, and the third has to be renewed in 2020, 2021. Mm -hmm. That's bad enough. But you actually also have an administration in Washington that actually does fundamentally doesn't believe in arms control. I'd actually go as far as to label Bush a militarist. Uh, sorry, uh, well, him too, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Trump's a, 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 an outright militarist, mm -hmm. and he's now progressively surrounding himself with people who believe in the exercise of military supremacy, okay. that they can engineer the world through threats and the use of force, and use arms races in a way to impose their will. Uh, so they literally want to terminate every contract in order to be free to... Well, uh, do this arms okay, so the, uh, 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 I think Wolfgang will have, have something to say about this, but uh, um, John Bolton tends to be the post poster boy yeah, for this, yeah. this kind of position, but he's not, he's not alone. I, I, I know people who, yeah. who would echo precisely the same arguments, perhaps in a, a more learned uh, way, but would, would, would say more or less the same thing. Yeah. So the danger here is you have an administration, you have 
the, 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 the whole system needs renewing and refreshing. Do we bring China into the INF? What about India and the Pakistan dynamic? What, what's Russia's... They're not part of any treaty so far. No. So, you know, we shouldn't be fixed on the treaty as though it were some sacred document, but what we need is a renewal of a process. So, uh, if, if I, I think if, if Obama were still president, it would have been... Well, we're, we, we will leave this treaty. We are giving notification that we will by this time, but what we would like to do is re renew, renegotiate, expand. To actually outright cancel it is dangerous and indicates a dangerous mindset in Washington. Yeah. Yeah. Do you agree? Yes, I When do. you look at the American administration, what do you see? What do they want? Well, I think it's interesting, and we, we should uh, uh, look at this very carefully. On the one hand, there is a Donald Trump who is surely not uh, out to wage another war in, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan. It's the last thing he wants to do. Uh, he wants to be able to say, America first. We, we are the most powerful country in the world. We can impose our will on uh, practically everybody else by threatening, maybe, but I think he doesn't want, he, he's not a warmonger, at least so far, my impression has been that that is really not Uh, not his plan. Uh, the problem is, if you leave these treaties and arrangements behind, uh, if you believe that you are stronger than the others and uh, by being unbound from these treaties, you can then be even stronger because you can build up your capacity, the question is whether that will not, by itself, almost automatically, Uh, lead the other powers to at least try to build up also. And then you have, whether one likes it or not, you have something that looks and smells and actually is a new kind of arms race. Mm -hmm. And I happen to believe that our, our collective experience of, this, uh, of the last, let's say, 60 years since uh, World War II has been that the more weapons we have, the more likely it is that somebody will try to use them. And that is why I, I'm a strong believer, I'm really a believer in uh, trying to limit the number of weapons, not only by sheer numbers, that's a very crude measure, but also in, uh, by looking at the quality um, and, um, and try to create more stability through the lowest possible numbers. And, and let me just add a point since we are here in, in the German city of Hamburg. I mean, this country has renounced the use, the possession of nuclear weapons twice, officially and permanently and uh, you know, legally, first by signing the Non-Proliferation Treaty in the 1970s, and second, uh, when we signed the two, famous 2 plus 4 treaty in 1990, which allowed the two German states to be reunified. In other words, there is no nuclear option for this country, which means almost automatically, I think, as a practicing diplomat, that we should support every idea which could lead to the reduction or eventually even the elimination of nuclear weapons. If we had the elimination of nuclear weapons, this country would be equal to all the others, and um, we would not be der Spielball. We would not be uh, simply at the mercy uh, of those who have nuclear powers and who might, hopefully they will not, uh, uh, conduct dangerous games <laughs> above our heads. Do you really believe a world without nuclear weapons is possible? Well, Klaus, that's a good question. I think that there is no such thing as an, as an objective impossibility in mm. foreign policy. Mm. There are maybe objective impossibilities in nuclear physics, but it is not impossible for me to imagine that a nuclear-free world could be created. The good question is, would it be more stable mm -hmm. than a world with nuclear deterrence? Maybe if we had no nuclear weapons at all, Uh, maybe more countries would wage war against each other because it would be less dangerous. Less the, the danger of mutual annihil annihilation, the mutual assured destruction uh, uh, might be less great. But that's a, almost a philosophical 
uh, thought. So I think that, you know, I've been a believer in the idea of global zero. I, I'm, a, I'm a signed member of the global zero group of people, which are, most of them are retired nuclear arms experts, generals, uh, nuclear negotiators. And uh, zero meaning no. Like, uh, uh, you know, for example, like, like, remember Henry Kissinger was one of them who uh, signed a letter some years ago. We should try to get out of this nuclear um, um, upgrading, uh, etc. So I think wisdom dictates that we should do everything that's possible to reduce these weapons, which is why I think what's, what's currently going on is really dangerous. It's not in our interest. It's not in the European interest. It's not in the global interest. And hopefully it can be reversed. If, so if do I can you come, come in on, on, on that. Yeah, can, can you imagine, an, because you've studied many American presidents and their strategies, can you imagine an American president giving up nuclear power? Uh, um, <laughs> what I can imagine, uh, I, I agree that in, in diplomacy, in, in life, everything is ultimately <laughs> openly possible. But I think what's a much more likely scenario is almost what was happening at the end of the Cold War, mm -hmm. which is a stabilization. So the, a nuclear non-proliferation regime, a, a broad agreement that who, who are the big nuclear powers, their relative arsenals, and the elimination of the most dangerous types of weapons. Mm -hmm. um, and if you could, if you, you, you could imagine a world where you keep reducing arsenals to a point where the arsenals become irrelevant. Uh, 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 there's an uh, American political scientist called John Mueller who's written a book called Retreat from Doomsday and recently in Foreign Affairs. He pointed out something he's been arguing for years and it's fundamentally true. The big weapons, the big megaton weapons are useless militarily. They're incredibly expensive. Uh, um, the powers that want them usually want them for, for fear of being coerced, mm -hmm. but actually the evidence is that nuclear coercion is very limited as a strategy. So it's, it's, it, it ought to be possible to create a nuclear a world structure that's stable and safe, and then maybe someday they just are eliminated, so through a series of stages. What's dangerous about a potential arms race in intermediate nuclear weapons, missiles, cruise missiles, land-based, uh, uh, air-launched, uh, submarine-launched, is precisely this, that when, when those weapons are approaching, somebody sees them on a radar, are they nuclear or are they conventional? Mm -hmm. Because they're useful in both, for both purposes. And if they're being used to begin to eliminate your command and control structure, which also happens to be the structure you use to command your own nuclear arsenal, you, you, face, you give your opponent a choice, which is use them or lose them. Mm -hmm. Or you use them and, or not use them and not be able to communicate with them and watch them be destroyed. And this is actually, in the, the Chinese-American dynamic, a very dangerous part of what's going on there. So you can imagine uh, a, a war that would involve a, the use of a lot of those weapons, air, air and sea launched, that disassembles the uh, Chinese nuclear command structure and you give somebody a choice, use them or lose them. I still would love to, to understand the strategy behind American politics. What, do the, uh, what does the uh, United States administration actually want? Do they, do they want to win the arms race? Do they think they can outspend Russia? What's, what's their goal? Because it's very hard to imagine, I actually find it impossible to believe that it's just Donald Trump being aggressive. It, it must be more than that. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm sure it is. I mean, there are a, a very important number of very, very smart, intelligent, experienced folks in the Pentagon, in the State Department, and uh, in other parts of the administration. We, we shouldn't only, you know, look at the tweets. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that uh, this idea of being able to impose to make the world do as America would like it to, uh, to act uh, includes the idea that uh, we need, if we want to impress our power on our adversaries, we need to demonstrate to them that we are so much more powerful than they are, 
That is what the United States is currently trying to do vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, leaving the Iran deal behind and telling the Iranians, we will squeeze you so much that you will have so much pain that you will come back to us and accept our conditions, not these softies from Europe uh, who negotiated with you uh, a deal that was too soft. Mm -hmm. That's essentially the Trump administration position. And on the nuclear front, I mean, looking at Russia and maybe also looking at China, I think what, uh, especially looking at Russia, what the Trump administration is um, thinking is that if we want to get the best possible future agreement with the Russians, we need to demonstrate to them that we can easily outspend them tenfold, twentyfold. I don't know whether everybody here in the audience is aware that the gross national product of Russia today is about the size of the Italian economy. And folks in the Pentagon know that. And they know that Russia can never compete if America seriously tries to build another 100, 500, 1,000, or whatever additional weapons. So I think this is actually a lever, a tool, to make the Russians think that maybe at some point we should not throw in the towel, but we should ask for a negotiation. But and then, of course, the Americans would be in an advantageous Probably. position because they negotiate from strength. And Klaus, let me just go back in history a little bit. Because in our current discussion about what the hell should uh, we in Germany do about the INF Treaty, etc., etc., uh, you know, I listen to what our foreign minister says and what the members of the Bundestag are saying. They should all remember what Helmut Schmidt said in 1978. This is 40 years ago. Because he knew, he was a very smart Bundeskanzler, he knew that we would not get anything out of the Russians, of the Soviets at the time, unless we would be able to negotiate not out of utter weakness, but, but out of relative strength. So he said, he went to London, gave a speech, and said, essentially, we need to show uh, the Soviets the torture instruments. And, um, and then maybe we can invite them to negotiate. And that's exactly what happened, and, we, uh, and it worked. So negotiating arms control out of a position of military or political weakness is not a great idea. Um, you were right there, weren't you? In the, at yes. the end of the 70s, the early 80s, you were part of the delegation. What did this contract, the one we're talking about, actually mean for German security? What did it mean for the German population? Well, look, uh, the point was uh, that the Russians, I mean the Soviet Union, uh, they were deploying these medium-range missiles which in theory and in practice could have reached easily practically each, each and every point in Western Europe, including uh, Germany. And the fear was that if there was ever going to be a conflict, um, the Americans would need to go to their intercontinental weapons directly, and that would probably not be credible. I mean, would an American president risk Denver for Halle? <laughs> yeah? Or for Hamburg, for that matter. Uh, so this question of coupling and decoupling, which is a, a complicated question of nuclear strategy, uh, played, a, played a, major, uh, a major role for the Germans. The question was, OK, the Americans are now saying, in order to balance this, uh, this, this difficult situation with this new Russian threat, we will deploy, station, uh, additional nuclear weapons in Germany pointing at the Soviet Union. And I was there. I remember I was a, a young uh, diplomatic officer in Bonn when we had 
on the, what is called the Hofgartenwiese in front of the university in Bonn, close to 300,000 demonstrators. It was the largest demonstration ever in those Cold War decades. In Bonn and, and in many other cities, people told the German government, we don't want new nuclear weapons on our territory, full stop. So it was a real crisis. Um, and it was only re resolved when um, we were lucky, uh, when the proposal that maybe uh, both sides, the Americans and the Russians, should simply eliminate this entire category, as, as, as you've said, Joe, this entire category of land-based medium-range weapons. And fortunately, that worked. So we've been, we've been safe from this, uh, uh, this category. There are, there are now some in Europe who are saying, given the aggressiveness of the current Russian regime, there are some, for example, in Poland, who would argue uh, if there is a question about new nuclear weapons in Europe, we'd be happy to have them in Poland. I don't believe this for a moment. I think that if there were a serious discussion about deploying uh, new and additional nuclear weapons in uh, Poland or in some other parts of our, of, you know, Central Europe, I think the same number of demonstrators would show up rather quickly. And, and most people forget that Poland, for example, has an eastern neighbor called Belarus. And the Belarusians, I was just in Minsk a few days ago, the Belarusians are saying, oh, the Poles are our neighbors, we like them, we want to have a, a great relationship. But if there are nuclear weapons pointing in our direction in Poland, all of a sudden we will not be friends anymore. So you can imagine how tensions would build up in an incredibly uh, heated way, in, 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 in an extremely adversarial manner. So. The, you're playing really with fire if we're thinking about new nuclear weapons land-based in Europe. I think this was maybe possible in the 20th century. I think it's not going to work this time. Just in case you might have wondered why I just smiled uh, three minutes ago, I was remembering um, these old days, this uh, demonstration in Bonn was the first demonstration I ever went to as a, as a very young student, <laughs> being 13 years old. Did uh, we they arrest you? No, they didn't. <laughs> You're careful. <laughs> but we took a bus from Münster, where I was born, to okay. Bonn. I had no idea that you were inside these buildings back then. <laughs> <laughs> but Joe, two questions for you. Um, first, what does Russia want? Um, they answered the American um, announcements by saying, well, we could build torpedoes, nuclear torpedoes, which will reach American coastline cities. Um, plus, um, well, we might be able to, to build missiles that will go around the whole globe. Um, what's the Russian strategy? First question. Second, what has Russia learned from the, the old arms races, the ones we've just been talking about? Well, um, in a sense, those are two connected uh, well, that's why you probably asked them together, but they are, <laughs> they're connected. Uh, uh, I think what ultimately Russia wants is to be taken seriously, mm -hmm. as, a, as, you know, to be a great power. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, and I think uh, w with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, 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 the 1990s, somehow that got lost in, in the mix, that somehow Russia was fitting into a wider s scope mm -hmm. that was being... Uh, a wider design was being designed elsewhere, and I think that's also their understanding of what was happening. So they, I think, when you, when you, when you, uh, and, and I, I, I try and read, you know, whether it's Lavrov or Putin, the speeches very carefully and see what, what's actually being said, because a lot is right there, right in front of you, and the consistent voice is, we actually want rules, we want uh, 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 um, um, the UN Charter to be taken seriously, because these rules protect them from uh, uh, overwhelming power in the other direction. I mean, that's, it's, it's pragmatic, it's simple as that. Um, if, I think the one thing they learned from the Cold War arms race is the, uh, the best way to counter uh, um, particularly American military strength is through an asymmetrical arms race. So when Reagan introduced the whole Star Wars scheme 
uh, um, they played with the idea. They even experimented uh, with systems. But they came to two conclusions. It's too expensive, and why, why do it? Because all you need to do is overwhelm your opponent's uh, defensive system with decoys. And this is exactly what happened with the cancellation of the ABM Treaty in 2002, is that the Russians began to develop uh, um, their, 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 their weapons so that they would be able to defeat any anti ballistic uh, defense system, overwhelm it. And I think that's exactly how they would react in uh, a new arms race. The, the torpedoes you talk about is a classic example of precisely that. We find a way to circumvent the, the opponent's major strength. I, I think they are well aware that they have a, a, an economy the size of Italy's, mm -hmm. but they, they, they need uh, uh, a, an international framework that raises them up to a level proportionate with their nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. What can Europe do? What can Germany do? It's, this sounds threatening, of course, because again, we are right in the middle of it. What could be a strategy for the European Union, for NATO, for Germany? I mean, when you ask, I mean, you know, in what atmosphere uh, are we having these discussions today? The really interesting and worrisome uh, uh, characteristic of of the, the current situation is that there is the absolute lack of trust mm -hmm. on both sides. Remember, even during the heyday of the Cold War, thinking of the 1970s and 80s, there were intense negotiations going on about all these treaties that we've mentioned, SALT, START, START I, START II. Uh, the INF Treaty is a, is a child of the Cold War. It was started in the early 80s, it was concluded and ratified in 87. No one knew that the Cold War would be over three years later. Mm -hmm. um, so what I think is so uh, worrisome is that it, at this very moment in 2018, the um, Russian military doesn't really have any way of talking to the American military. Uh, American diplomats are currently not only not allowed, they have not been allowed to talk to Iranian diplomats, which is maybe also not such a great idea, because if you don't talk, you can't negotiate. Um, but American diplomats are under strict ru uh, rules and regulations. Uh, they need special permission to talk to a single Russian. In other words, this is a uh, from, from, from my point of view as a, di practic a practitioner of diplomacy, this is terrible. Mm -hmm. um, the only way to uh, make things go forward is by trying to re-establish, to recreate opportunities for, 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 for trust, trust building. And that brings me to, to your question, sorry for the long way around. So what can we do? I think what we can do, what we should do, what we probably must do, is try to impress on both sides that we are not, we Europeans, are not going to uh, tolerate this uh, total lack of dialogue. I think it's great that even if we don't like Trump, or, or, if, or most of you probably don't trust Trump, but I think it is actually a good idea and it should be welcomed that he and, and Putin are now meeting again in just a few days. Hopefully this will lead to a little more substance. But we should demand of both sides that this summit meeting should be followed by negotiations about strategic arms, about the INF issue, there is a big issue of compliance. Um, the Americans are saying the Russians are in violation of the of treaties specifically, and the, the Russians also have some complaints. I think this needs to be worked out. And we would be more credible if we said to both sides, we believe that you need to offer to the other side full transparency and come clean. Uh, it would not be in our interest to defend the INF Treaty 
if we know that it is totally and completely being violated by one or both of these sides. So we should make the strongest possible appeal and we should even say, you know, we're, we're not going to talk to you guys anymore unless you talk to each other uh, or unless you let us arrange for a platform where we can kickstart some discussion about something. Now, what could be the something? There's a, there's a, there's a shooting war still going on in Ukraine. Um, could this be a theater where, where discussions could uh, take place, constructive discussions between Americans and Russians? What about Syria? Uh, there are some other places uh, around the world. Think of Yemen and, and, and Libya and uh, North Korea, uh, etc. There's plenty of ongoing conflicts where Russia and the United States could retrain themselves to actually create a, a kind of win-win. Even if it were just a little bit of win-win, it would be a lot better than not talking to each other at all. So I think that's our job. Joe, looking at the history of, uh, of arms races and negotiations, what could Europe learn? What could be a European strategy? Um, well, I think, first of all, to embed precisely that kind of approach in international organizations. So it would be done through uh, the UN. Um, it's um, to, to mobilize public opinion, of course, to demonstrate. Because I think one of the problems, of course, with um, particularly U US security policy is it tends to be uh, uh, conducted in uh, um, uh, uh, in an isolated, unilateral fashion where there's a there's a powerful continuity, right? So trying to, trying to break that. I mean, the, the irony of Trump is he actually had the right idea. He has the right idea of, of uh, uh, again, it's the same idea of some kind of big reset mm -hmm. and grand bargain. Uh, um, um, I'm not sure there's anything particularly to be learned from the history of arms negotiations that would shed any light on this. What I would say is that that, that is the, the deal you need. You need some kind of grand, big deal. The problem is, And, 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 and maybe Wolfgang, you, you, you would agree or disagree, is that any deal done by Trump would be a bit not, uh, uh, toxic to the Democrats in the United States. So in domestic politics in the US, even if it were some kind of grand design, and particularly if it's cutting deals over Syria and, and, and the Ukraine, I could see the Democrats using that in the same way the Republicans use the, 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 the Iranian treaty as a stick to beat the other party with. Because in, 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 in a lot of respects, domestic politics in the US shapes American policy and world, pol and world politics dispropor you know, uh, disproportionately because of the importance of the United States. Just very briefly, because today is the day of the midterm elections, if the Democrats happen to win um, both chambers of, uh, of Congress, Uh, would it change the situation we are talking about now? Would it change uh, the arms race we are discussing? It's here? not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, oh, too uh, bad. <laughs> uh, uh, of course, we don't know. But I think it is, it is totally unlikely that the Democrats would, would get control of both houses. The Senate. I think it's most likely no. It's likely, it's, po it's probable that they would get the House but probably not the Senate. That's what I've been hearing from the experts who, who watch this professionally. You mean those experts who said Hillary Clinton would be <laughs> yes, the president? Exactly yeah. those. Uh, exactly those. Uh, so we can't be sure un until, uh, until we know exactly what came out tomorrow. But let me, let, let me go this far. Let's assume the Democrats uh, you know, occupy the majority in the House. Yeah. Uh, that would be a big victory for the Democrats. Would that change anything in the area that we're talking about here? I don't think so. Uh, why not? Because if there is any role for the US Congress in the conduct of international relations, uh, the, uh, the, the treaty business, it's, it's a matter for the Senate and for the Senate only. The House can create lots of problems for Mr. Trump domestically. They can start investigations into his business deals, etc. That would probably create lots of headaches for mm -hmm. him. But in terms of the European concerns on 
on uh, conflicts and on U.S. Russian uh, uh, U.S. Russian situation, I think the outcome of today's election in America will not have much of a bearing. Mm -hmm. And while I have the floor, let me just add a little revolutionary <laughs> thought, if I may. Of course. You know, and of course, you are absolutely right. Uh, Trump has this huge uh, rock hanging around his neck, which is his uh, Russian connection, the suspicion that there was something fishy um, two years ago. So how do you get rid of that? If Trump asked me, what can I do to overcome this? I would say it's very easy. Name Latin Russia? N no, name a Democrat. Mm. Name a Democrat to be the leader of the negotiations with Russia. Make yeah. him the, the chief negotiator. Mm -hmm. You know, a recognized democratic leader. Uh, and make the negotiations transparent. And make the negotiations transparent. Then, you know, no one can accuse you that you are sort of behind the scenes um, uh, making your, your ugly deals with, uh, with, with Putin. Uh, so I think it is possible. And this would actually not be the first time. We had uh, many years ago... Uh, a situation where Bill Clinton appointed a senator from the Republican side to be his Secretary of Defense, a gentleman who is still around, Bill Cohen. And that worked quite well because in this way they, they were sort of on both sides of the fence. And it worked against the polarization of American politics and society. I don't think Trump is capable of doing this, but, <laughs> but uh, if he were smart, if he were interested in bridging this, polar, this gap, that's what he should do. Name a responsible Democrat to work with him on some of these international issues. Very good idea. Obama. Yeah. Obama yeah. is a very good suggestion. That yes. would be a great choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Different world it would be. Do you agree? Are you I looking at the midterms? Uh, do you find them important looking at the topic we are debating here? Uh, uh, no, I, I agree okay. precisely with uh, Wolfgang, that, uh, uh, particularly because the US president has such huge scope in yeah. foreign policy and defense. Yeah. So the, actually the danger is, is he's just going to be so annoyed with and, and gummed up with domestic policy, he, he'll just preoccupy himself with uh, 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 foreign policy and uh, defense. And that's, that's dangerous. Uh, because, you know, again, who, who's he, I mean, I, there's little evidence that he reads very much uh, 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 in any depth. There's, you know, so, I mean, he even disavows documents produced by his own national security staff uh, uh, on a regular basis. So you have to wonder who, who are the voices that are powerful around them at the moment feeding what is a basic instinct for military solutions to every problem. Let's not forget, they just sent more soldiers to the Mexican, U.S.-Mexican frontier than there are in uh, uh, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's, that, that's, sc that's uh, scary. I mean, just, <laughs> yes. uh, 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 and legally, these soldiers going to the frontier can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, they right? can't. <laughs> so, so that's an instinct that... that there are certain voices that are feeding. Uh, uh, um, so what you would, and, and that's the, so you've got the man in the middle surrounding himself with people advising on international relations that for a long time have felt that um, the international system, what scholars would call sort of the, the linkages, the integration of the international economy, uh, have actually limited the exercise of military uh, power, US power. If you look at the national security documents they, under Trump, they all have as a subtitle or somewhere in there, you know, we are returning to a world of great power competition. And for, and, and I think in his mind, every relationship is either transa is transactional and it's power in its rawest forms that determine the outcome. Um, and that's an illusion. Um, military supremacy is always a wasting asset. Because, and this is, the, this is in the history of arms races, whether it's Admiral Tirpitz or the Japanese militarists or uh, at various stages on different, both sides of the Cold War, the idea that you can win an arms race is the illusion, right? 
it's a, the, even the, the metaphor itself, uh, what we're talking about is an intensive military competition. Races have an end point, right? You can see it. The but finish line. The has finish to be, line, yeah. yeah. But with an arms race, it's like a roller, a dangerous roller coaster ride, and you don't know whether you're going to flip off it or. Mm. Uh, uh, and if it becomes an autonomous dynamic, which precisely the deployment of intermediate range conventional and nuclear weapons in mixed arsenals could create, then things get really very dangerous. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, for a second, let's, go, let's get back to what Europe should do. Should Europe actually build an army, armed forces, like the ones Emmanuel Macron has been talking about yet again? Should Europe maybe even get nuclear weapons? Yeah, it was the French who killed the idea the first time, <laughs> if I remember correctly, <laughs> from <laughs> the first time it was proposed. Um, so Would it help? It, hey? Would it help? Would it help Europe? Uh, um, I, so I, I would just remove that from the context of the wider discussion about the arms race, because I, I think it's a good idea, mm -hmm. even in a more peaceful context, for Europe to integrate and cooperate more on the defense side. Mm -hmm. uh, just sort of the proliferation of... Well, you, just, you, you get more bang for buck by cooperating in things like maintenance, uh, uh, purchasing major weapon systems, uh, uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. All, all of these aspects would be much better for deeper cooperation. Of course, Brexit is going to make this mm -hmm. uh, 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 much more difficult because in the sort of the grand puzzle of European uh, uh, military power, Britain is a, is a big piece. Of course it is, yeah. Yeah. But uh, um, raising defense budgets to the 2% as promised uh, of the NATO countries, renewing uh, defense programs, replacing Cold War era equipment, um, doing in a lot of respects what the Finns have done in response to the heating up of what's going on on their front, you know, in, in Russia in response to the Crimean annexation and the war in uh, the Ukraine. All of that makes sense. Should Europe get nuclear weapons? Should Germany? Uh, no. Uh, uh, Germany is not, cannot be must not even think about mm -hmm. getting uh, uh, the hand on nuclear weapons. It's forbidden. Mm -hmm. We have uh, renounced and uh, we shouldn't even hint mm -hmm. at this uh, option because it would only distract uh, and, and create animosities that are unnecessary. But I think, yes, uh, we should think about, uh, about options. Are, we, are there options? Well, first of all, let me say, I think in the short run, I mean, thinking about, let's say, the next three, five, six years or more, I see no alternative to the continued total reliance on the American nuclear umbrella. Full stop. There's just nothing that can replace that. If we believe that there are nuclear weapons in the world that might be dangerous for us, Russian or maybe in the future Iranian or for that matter Chinese or others, then we need some kind of uh, protection and that is being provided or has been provided by the United States and there is no short term or medium term uh, alternative to that. But in the sort of longer term, I think it is not forbidden to start thinking about what might be European options. I mean, let me throw out, and I'm very careful, I'm saying this is just a, you know, sort of an academic exercise. Uh, I don't know a single senior official in Berlin who has been talking about this seriously. Mm -hmm. But one could imagine, let's say, let's imagine the Americans are saying, we're no longer interested in protecting you guys. It costs too much, the risk is too high, you're now on your own. So what do we do? This actually could become a possibility. It could, yes. This is why I'm saying it. So what, what could we do? We could start a discussion with our uh, French neighbors. They have the Force de Frappe, mm -hmm. which is designed exclusively in terms of size and, and trajectory and, and, and uh, strategy to protect nothing but the French homeland, but in a, in a kind of a tripwire function. 
so the French also, in a way, rely on the existence of the American nuclear deterrent. But they have their limited force de frappe to um, force the Americans into a conflict if ever France would be attacked, mm -hmm. right? So we could start a discussion with the French and we could say, you have the capabilities, you could build some different systems. Uh, if we pay for half of it, would, could you design a system that would cover, let's say, the territory of Germany also? And would you give us a seat at your nuclear decision-making table so that we, are, that we know that it's, <laughs> that it's coming when it's coming? Um, um, is, there, is it possible to imagine that? Yes, it is possible because uh, there have been occasionally throughout the last number of decades um, overtures by successive French uh, presidents who have been, of course, burdened by the enormous cost of the French nuclear force. Uh, there was, I wasn't present there, but I, I know it happened. There was uh, a discussion once where Mitterrand approached Helmut Kohl and said, what about it? And uh, apparently Kohl said, what about it? And said, uh, let's talk about other things. So it didn't lead to anything. Uh, uh, there were some other discussions a little later. It, so far, it hasn't led to anything because on the German side, one didn't see the need and one didn't want to rock the boat vis-a-vis -vis the American guarantor, right? So if the situation changes, if the transatlantic situation were to deteriorate, I think this might be one possible option, a kind of an extens extension of the French nuclear deterrent. Would it be possible to think of the same thing with Britain? Why not? But the British force is even more dependent on the Americans mm -hmm. because they don't even develop their own nuclear weapons. It's all American stuff. And, so, and of course, Great Britain is moving into another direction. Yeah, right but now. we're still in. We're still together in NATO. Yeah, and, of course. Uh, actually, yeah, in the scenario still. you're talking about, if that's almost replaying the f late 40s, early 50s, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. you could see Britain and uh, gravitating because, uh, you know, and when it comes to defense and foreign policy, I think sanity would come back. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully, Great Britain. Hopefully. <laughs> and, uh, uh, no, you'd see some sort of Western European Defense Union. Uh, 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 I'm thinking about the, the, the 48 Treaty and uh, the, those early discussions about forming some kind of uh, uh, European core. And I mean, in the scenario Wolfgang's talking about, having the, the sea launched nuclear weapons would be sort of the nice icing on the cake yes. for mm -hmm that kind of uh, scenario. And you know, it's not like you have to match the entire Russian arsenal, weapon for weapon, because the whole point of the uh, 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 nuclear revolution is that, you know, it doesn't, uh, you don't, uh, more nuclear weapons don't protect you from a few nuclear weapons, right? Only a few of them have to get through to impose uh, a disproportionate cost for any kind of use. Before we open the floor uh, to quest uh, questions from the audience, uh, let's enter two very different topics. First, um, the first one being, we've just talked about uh, Russia and the United States here, but is there a worldwide arms race already going on? Um, are there nations that are actually even a bigger threat than the two we, we are talking about, or are terrorists already capable of using nuclear force? Uh, do we know where all the nuclear arms actually are? Is there a worldwide arms race uh, already going on? So um, when I scan the globe and I'm looking for the kind of intense military competitions that might lead to a conflict, it's, it's very difficult to see anything on, on the kind of scale that you saw in the 20th century. But there are dangerous zones, right? There are dangerous like spots. Like you said, one weapon would be enough. And one weapon is, is enough. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, uh, uh, South Asia, the Pakistan-India uh, uh, dynamic. I think today, India just launched its first missile boat. Um, I think, the, but the most dangerous is the the military buildup or competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia raises possibilities and dangers. Um, and you know how much is that as a proxy war, mm -hmm. really, or a developing proxy cold war? Um, 
th those are the, the, the dangerous spots. I think the, the, the whole terrorist threat is grossly exaggerated. Mm -hmm. The idea that somebody could build a bomb in their garage uh, um, is, is, is well, it's just nonsense. But they could, the couldn't they get their hands on a weapon that already exists? Well, it's, but you know, yeah, except that when you, once you acquire these things, you, you tend to create systems to protect them. And I think just about everywhere, uh, uh, I think there was actually, a, was it Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State proposed to Pakistan that there would be some kind of joint agreement that the US would protect the Pakistani nuclear. <laughs> am, I, am I remembering that correctly? I mean, of course they laugh that off, but you know, they, they, they're protecting their own, they don't want their weapons to fall into hands that would, because any, if a nuclear weapon from a, a government arsenal were to find its hands, find itself in some non-state actor's hands and they used it, who would be held responsible? Mm -hmm. The state. So, I mean, every, every state has a deep interest in protecting their nuclear mm -hmm. arsenal. Um, there are certainly the possibilities of the development of arms races beyond the nuclear sphere. Um, certainly all the world's militaries, the big ones, see uh, uh, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. as somehow it's a future game changer, that if it, you could somehow master it in ways um, that would give you an edge in, in conventional war, that would be a way of leapfrogging well ahead of all your opponents. Um, there is a lot of misunderstanding about the whole cyber sphere, mm -hmm. and I think the whole idea of cyber war and cyber arms races is, is, is the, the metaphor is wrong. It isn't war and there is no arms race. It's espionage, mm. it's propaganda, it's, it's uh, 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 sabotage maybe, but it's not war, right? Um, so we need to be careful about where we also apply these metaphors. But I, I think there's no hidden mm. nuclear weapons out there. That actually was the second issue I was <laughs> okay. getting at. Uh, but but um, Wolfgang, to, 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 get, to get your point of view here, is there a worldwide arms race? Well, if you look at the numbers, um, there is a, uh, an institution that issues each year an, uh, an overview of uh, the arms trade, CIPRI, Swedish the Swedish Peace Research Institution. Uh, I, I've actually been on their board for many years, and they do uh, really good work, uh, you know, in detail, uh, figuring out uh, who exports what to whom, and how much money is spent by country A through B, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you look at the patterns of the last few years, you find that, of course, there is more money spent in Europe by Russia, by NATO, but what far exceeds our kind of build-up is the build-up, the money spent in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, a good example, uh, but even more importantly in East Asia. China is building, uh, you know, a, a new navy kind of, uh, that costs a lot of money. Uh, other Asian countries are trying to react to that. So most of the additional money, let, let's leave aside the United States, most of the additional money for defense expenditure is actually going into Asia and uh, the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And that's of course worrisome because we haven't really, during this hour or so, we have been talking a lot about nuclear arms control or the absence of it. Uh, it's important that we remember there is no, no conventional arms uh, limitation negotiation uh, to speak of anywhere. We used to have, again, uh, you know, speaking of the Cold War, we used to have what we called the CFE Treaty, mm -hmm. Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, also a child of the Cold War, which limited the number of tanks and artillery uh, uh, vehicles, etc., etc., that European countries, including Russia and the United States, were able to have here on the European continent. It's gone out the window. Everybody can buy as many tanks as he, he or she has money to pay for. That is bad. And um, uh, quite frankly, I think that the future is probably not going, I mean, I'm, I'm hypothesizing here, but I think the future is probably not going to be one where we will be faced with 
you know, a continuation of these bilateral U.S.-Russian treaties, I think the future will more likely be something like the Iran agreement, mm -hmm. where four, five, six or more countries negotiate with one or several other countries, maybe a regional arrangement. Um, if we had an opportunity to renegotiate or extend the INF treaty, the, the, the medium range treaty, it would have been great if, if this negotiation had already started a few years ago and if we could have proposed to China mm -hmm and to some other nuclear countries like, uh, let's say, Pakistan and India, to join the treaty. Join, yeah. mm. So in, or, in, in order to, to eliminate not only on the US and the Russian side this category of weapons, but essentially to eliminate it uh, in all major nuclear weapon states. That would have been a great idea. But I think that is now an opportunity that was unfortunately not seized. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, we have an absence of, of efforts, of arrangements, of, of negotiations. We have an absence of trust. And more money is likely to be spent in coming years. Uh, the curve is pointing this way. This is very unfortunate. And now let's put it briefly. Um, let's talk about the issue that Mr. Paulson um, mentioned in his, in his smart introduction. Uh, artificial intelligence, um, um, cyber war. Why isn't cyber war a war? Because no humans are being killed. Yes, and you're not. You're not. It's not. There's no kinetic interaction at the other yeah. side. You're not destroying. Well, again, you know, uh, 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 um, all the scenarios tend to be. You know, science fiction does a great job of this. You know, somebody's sitting at a computer and banging away, and things blow up on the other side. But th th this is, you know, uh, uh, um, this is fantasy. What? Most of the activity that's nefarious that takes place in, in the cybersphere is espionage, reconnaissance, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and I think that you know again how do you how do you how do you class, classify? I, I just prefer propaganda as the word, but sort of what uh, uh, Russia and other countries are accused of in interfering in the domestic politics of other countries uh, using uh, 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 Facebook and other platforms to spread a particular message. These are, at least for the 20th century, uh, features that are typical of interstate relations. They're not unusual. And I think we need to keep it contained correctly, because I think the second you start labeling this stuff war, <laughs> and you talk about cyber attacks, mm -hmm. when, when does shutting down somebody's internet become an act of war? Right, uh, an Article Five type uh, uh, intervention, mm -hmm. and it, it's, I think we need to keep keep these things separate. That, 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 that's 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 just my view. The 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 the, the um, with artificial intelligence, the, the 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 danger that is imagined is that we will create so many autonomous weapon systems that you know. Uh, will somebody be able to ha either hack them, or you know, do we? Do they wake up one day and sort of say, "Hmm, you know, humans, we don't need them." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, we've we've all seen the movies. The the but again, I think I think th these are the at the moment the, the that kind of artificial intelligence the capabilities and just just not there, right? Um, where, where there are actual military applications for artificial intelligence is in the same way in any business would apply it for supply chains. So increasing the efficiency of being able to supply forward forces. Uh, situational awareness. Uh, um, the battlefield is now so full of information flowing into command posts that having something to sift it and to identify threats early on uh, to be in situ to be able to react in situations where human decision making loop is just going to be too slow. So um, the Israeli um, anti missile system is actually automated. It'll 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 defend against a missile attack on its own. Mm -hmm. And these are the applications so far. But any widespread but it's it's this paradox of contemporary militaries all agree that this is the future and this is the way we're going to go. But they don't have a clear concept of how this would revolutionize anything. Are you going to be able to create a supermind someday, sort of Clausewitz in a computer, 
that would be able to run your war for you? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Wolfgang, can you imagine treaties um, in the future, of course, uh, that are about cyber, about artificial intelligence? Well, I, would, I, I, I would hope that we can get there. Uh, the problem is uh, a treaty, an agreement, uh, needs to be verifiable. Mm -hmm. If you want to get it through your parliament, of course, man. your parliament will say, how do you know the other guy will respect these rules uh, if you sign them? Can we uh, uh, verify? Can we check? And that is an, an unresolved issue in cyber so far. Uh, but I believe that uh, those are right who ask for a continued effort, even though it's it's conceptually difficult, who ask for uh, continued efforts to create some ground rules. A senior person at Microsoft who spoke at our Munich Security mm -hmm. Conference last year uh, came up with this notion, why not create for the cyberspace something that looks like the Geneva conventions for the conduct of classic war. Remember the mm -hmm. Geneva Conventions established you, you shall not use cruel and, 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 and uh, you know, um, inhumane weapons. Uh, you shall not kill civilians unnecessarily. You shall not attack a hospital, etc. So these are Geneva type uh, rules for classic kinetic, as you say, war where people shoot at each other. Uh, is, is it possible to imagine rules in cyberspace? Uh, I mean, one proposed rule is uh, we shall refrain from any activities that would endanger uh, the essential infrastructure of, you know, the other country. Um, we've had actually cases, so, you know, I would slightly disagree uh, with you, Joe. I think that the problem with cyber is that it can, of course, uh, be, it can be used to create enormous damage. It can be used to create enormous damage. And we have seen um, sort of, we've, we've seen damage to these uh, Iranian centrifuges. Uh, we've, seen, uh, uh, we've seen incidents in Ukraine where electricity was cut off to hundreds of thousands of people for an extended period of time. We've had incidents in England where uh, hospitals suffered from a lack of electricity where operations couldn't be conducted, where probably a number of people died because there was no, no uh, ur uh, urgent medical care available, etc., etc. So the, the, the capacity to inflict damage on infrastructure, on, um, on companies, on institutions uh, is there and it can be, you know, conceptualized in an even larger form. So... I think we need to be prepared to think about the, that the conflict of the future is, is, is likely to be quite often conducted not in the way that a tank crosses a border and starts shooting at the village on the other side or that an airplane flies over and drops bombs. Uh, the conflict of the future, if you, if you think of all the conflicts of 2018, the ones that we have today, yeah, there is not one conflict that looks like World War I or World War II where nations fight other nations for territory or for simple supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. All of these conflicts, Libya, Somalia, Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, Mali, wherever you look, it's, you know, Afghans against Afghans, Syrians against Syrians for ethnic, religious or other, uh, you know, often irrational reasons, uh, with lots of support from the outside world, money from Arab countries or from Russia or from America, from the CIA or so. so and also remember, uh, in Crimea, when, when events four years ago in, in eastern Ukraine started happening, Russia never admitted that they were a party to this conflict. Mm -hmm. To this day, they're saying, oh, these are just these guys, uh, we, uh, them, yeah. and if we say, we, but we saw some Russian soldiers there, yeah, these were the guys on vacation. Uh, they just happened to be there. Russia has consistently refused to accept responsibility for the fact that it is, of course, in charge 
of what's going on in Ukraine. And I think this kind of conflict is quite likely to be the model mm-hmm. that, uh, uh, or, or take, the, take the other case, uh, Georgia, where Russia intervened in, tw- in 2008, arguing that it needed to protect the minority of you know, South Ossetia and Abkhazia against um, the Georgian government. Well, if you take that kind of argument to uh, the, the logical conclusion, then um, let's say if uh, France uh, has uh, some French people living in Spain, which they do, and if Spain were to mistreat these French people, then France would then have a right to walk into uh, Spain and um, uh, uh, and 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 uh, and start a and start a war. So these hybrid kinds of conflicts, where there is no declared war, where um, where you act through um, you know um, through proxies, mm-hmm. also. Uh, I think is the future, including then with cyber and with arti- with artificial intelligence, whatever that then means. But it means that things will happen much quicker, much quicker than um, uh, humans can react. And no treaty will be able to prevent that. And that is why I think we need to go back to the drawing board and start working on arrangements and treaties. Uh, the the uh, time for crisis diplomacy is not over. Not true. I think the time for crisis diplomacy in a serious manner is only starting again, given all these rising risks. Let's um, open the floor to questions and let's maybe collect three questions first and then answer them. May I ask you to be brief and really ask a question instead of giving speeches? Who wants to go first? Mm. Ah, no one. There is a question. Here's one. Mm-hmm. Can you wait for the microphone, sir? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Mm. Sorry. Is it possible to speak German? It's uh, easier for me. Is it? Mein mm-hmm. mein mein Name ist Koppelmann. Uh, wir hören in unseren uh, Sendung TV und in den Zeitungen immer Die Russen sind generell aggressiv und wir machen das fest an der Aneignung der Krim. Mhm. Ich habe mir das mal als Anlass genommen, die Vorgeschichte dieser Krim-Entwicklung mir mal anzulesen. Und jedenfalls, was die Krim angeht, bin ich der Meinung, dass zuerst der Westen aggressiv war und sich dann die Russen gegen die Aggressivität des Westens gewehrt haben. Ich habe keine Ahnung, ob das in den übrigen Konflikten auch so ist. Deshalb... Könnte es vielleicht typisch sein, dass die Russen sich wehren gegen Aggression des Westens? Vielleicht eine Anmerkung noch. Bis die Sowjetunion gefallen ist, war da der Kommunismus eine große Rolle. Ich wollte nicht kommunistisch werden. Deshalb fand ich das gut, dass unter dem Schutz der USA wir uns dagegen wehren konnten. Nach dem Zusammenbruch der Sowjetunion spielt der Kommunismus keine Rolle mehr. Russland hat kein Interesse, die ganze Welt zu beherrschen. Aber die USA haben es, weil sie die Ersten sein wollen und ihre Geschäfte machen wollen. Dankeschön. Before, before we answer that one, there's a second question over there. My name is Davala Kalovrikovic. I think it is not a surprise that the golden age of uh, um, peace treaties Uh, arms race treaties has been in the 70s and the 80s. It was a time when democracy has been also developing. Mm -hmm. We have all smiled a bit about the demonstrations in Bonn in in the 1980s. But I think it does correspond that, um, that we do need a development of democracy in uh, order to develop also our network of treaties. Mm -hmm. So my question rather is about the role of Europe in that regard, because we all are, or at least I am, 
worried about the state of democracies in the European Union and beyond. Mm -hmm. And I would like to comment you on, on that one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. A third one? You go first and we get to you a little later. Um, ich habe ganz kurz und knapp eine Frage. Um, Herr Ischinger hat das vorhin gesagt, mit den 80er Jahren Friedensbewegung, auch ich war da ordentlich unterwegs gegen die Stationierung der ähm, Pershing 2 der Cruise Missiles. Ähm, ich weiß nicht, wenn äh, Trump das Abkommen heute aufkündigen will und er die äh, Mittelstreckenraketen stationieren will, dann ist das doch mit der Absicht, ähm, da irgendwie Ziele in mittler, mittlerer Nähe zu erreichen. Und das wäre doch dann wahrscheinlich, wenn er irgendwie auf Russland guckt, dass er die dann auch in Europa wieder stationieren will. Meine Frage ist, wie souverän ist Europa, wenn Europa sagt, nein, das wollen wir nicht, weil das Bürgerbegehren einfach so groß ist wie in den 70er, 80er Jahren, dass die Unruhe so groß ist, dass wir sagen, das wollen wir nicht. Ähm, wie souverän ist Deutschland, wenn andere europäische Nationen, zum Beispiel ähm, England, die jetzt nicht mehr zur EU gehören demnächst, oder Polen sagen, ja, okay, dann komm mal, du kannst uns schützen gegen die UdSSR. Was für eine Möglichkeit präzise hat Europa oder Deutschland zu sagen, lass, geh ab von Hoff mit deinen Mittelstreckenraketen, wir wollen dich hier nicht in Europa. Vielen Dank. Could you understand the questions? Sorry. Could you understand the questions, were they translated for you? I only didn't, I missed the first question. First one was about uh, Russia, uh, if Russia actually was defending itself much more than being the, aggress uh, the aggressor. Okay. You want to go first? Uh, it's, there are two things that are typical historically at arms races, and there's one really obvious exception to that, but uh, typically somebody else's arming is framed as both offensive and originating from somehow something in their domestic politics, whether it's a, uh, authoritarian politics trying to divert uh, uh, in, you know, public interest to foreign threats or military industrial complexes. Uh, so that's typically the way you see it. Typically also, when you flip it around, that's exactly how the opponent also frames. That's what makes it an arms race, right? When you, when, when you, you, when you see yourself engaging an opponent that you think is acting for reasons other than your own interactions, where fundamentally, uh, 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 it's the interactions that are driving the arms race. Uh, military industrial complexes are real, right? It's, it's no surprise that it was Dwight Eisenhower who labeled the idea and denounced it in 1951 because he was right there from the very birth of the military industrial complex. In the 1920s, he was responsible for drafting the US mobilization plans. He understood the relationship between economy, uh, universities, uh, finance, and, and, and war. So the Cold War, I think you're right that a lot of uh, uh, the actions and reactions were defensive, but that doesn't mean they weren't a dangerous or escalating and potentially spiraling out of control. The um, ideological uh, d dimension made it difficult because one of the problems with the Cold War was understanding how ideology also influenced behavior. So it created a lot of tension, misperception, uh, um, which is why today you know, that we don't have that ideological element to uh, international politics. But what we do have, and what's very disturbing for me as someone who spent most of his time you know, between 1919 and 1942, is the wave of sort of authoritarian politics we have now and the relationship that tends to have with uh, governments that turn to military expenditure, to police states. This is, this is what disturbs me and keeps me up at night. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question, I think two questions that related to more or less the same thing. The state of democracies. Precisely, and, and it's sovereignty of, of Europe. Yeah, uh, well, and, and, and the importance of peace movements, I would yes. say. And, there's, there's, and uh, um, you're exactly right in identifying the 1970s. Sort of, so that's actually also the moment when historians begin to talk about a real return of globalization and a transnational networks of understanding. And there are, I, 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 I'm skeptical about the idea, but there are those who would argue that it's precisely that that brought the Cold War to a successful mm -hmm. end. Uh, um, you know, well, I think that is the question. Who is sovereign? Mm -hmm. 
right, in a world of nuclear weapons uh, and the inter military interrelationships we have. Um, but the, the, we, I think we, we actually discussed earlier what the implications of an of a independent Europe would, would look like. It would mean relying on somebody's weapon systems because you can't do without it to exist in the structure, the global structure we have at the moment. Um, uh, let me start by trying to respond to the question about Europe and, uh, and the, the INF uh, question. Uh, how sovereign are we? What, what, uh, what can we as Germans, as, as Europeans uh, do? Um, you know, on a, on a sort of more philosophical note, one could uh, make the following point. We in Germany, in particular we in Germany, because we had this uh, incredible event of unification in 1990, um, unexpected, uh, uh, you know, uh, fireworks. And right after unification, and I bet each and every single person in this room has heard this sentence a hundred times, every leading German politician, whether on the far right or the far left or in the middle, said, we are now a happy nation living in paradise because we are unified and we are surrounded only by friends. We are surrounded only by friendly neighbors who are all in NATO or in the EU or in both. The only neighbor who is not a member of uh, uh, EU or NATO is Switzerland, and even Switzerland is a friendly neighbor, <laughs> probably. <Thank you>. Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, no one disputes that. They so, are, they are Swiss. <laughs> voila. The problem is that this sentence has had the effect of an extreme, extremely strong sleeping pill on the German mindset. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, th we thought, and we know, and it's true f until today, that we are surrounded by friendly you know, EU partners, even if we have the occasional problem with the Poles or the Hungarians or, uh, uh, for that matter, now the Italians in the EU. But this sentence, we're now surrounded only by friends, covered up the fact that when these neighbors look in the other direction, outward, they look at chaos, they look at conflict. The Poles have been looking at a Russia which they are fearful of, whether you like it or not. The Poles believe that they need protection against Russia. Ask any Pole, that's what he will tell you. The Italians have been looking for many years, and we were looking the other way, we Germans. We thought, this is a matter for the Italians. They were looking at Libya, at, uh, uh, you know, at, at all the other countries that allowed people to come as refugees or migrants across the Mediterranean, and no one helped them. So they were looking at chaos. Uh, when the Syrian conflict broke out, it end, the refugees ended up by hundreds, many hundreds of thousands, not only in Turkey, but of course in Greece and in, in, in other uh, parts of our circle of friendly neighbors. In other words, it took us very, very long. It only started to dawn on this nation that um, even if we are surrounded by friends, we need to think about these problems on the other side of our neighbors, because if we don't, these problems will have a tendency of coming right to our back door or front door. So that's the, f that's the first point. And the second point is that we have also gotten used to the idea, which is uh, totally ahistorical that, and, and, and practically impossible. We got, we, we've been getting used over four or five decades to the idea that we can outsource so successfully for two generations, three generations maybe, essential parts of our security needs to the farmer in Idaho. Mm -hmm. And the farmer in Idaho, who is the guy who votes for Donald Trump, um, <laughs> is being told, why do I need to pay taxes uh, to defend Europe if the Europeans don't do anything for themselves? That's the argument that you've been hearing in the United States. And I think it's, in that sense, it is 
a, a welcome wake-up call, what we've been getting from Donald Trump, who tells us, grow up, become adult, take care of your own needs. That's what Merkel said, Angela Merkel said, when she spoke in Trudering in May of last year, when she said, wir müssen anscheinend jetzt durch die Dinge selber in die Hand nehmen. We need to take care of our needs ourselves. She said that in some, in some way. Um, and it was thought to be a, almost a break of, of a long tradition of relying totally on the United States. So I think that the question of European sovereignty uh, is extremely important, but we are far from having it. We are far from having it. And when people speak, as Macron does, uh, of a European army, the idea of a European army has been in practically every German political party program for, for many years. But believe me, one thing uh, is very important. A European army makes sense, but it makes sense only if we know that we can speak with one voice and actually make decisions as Europeans. <laughs> On, in, the, in recent quick, conflict quick cases, decisions too. in recent mm -hmm. conflict cases like Syria or, for that matter, Ukraine, we had a very hard time mm -hmm. making decisions. Why? Because we operate in foreign policy on the uh, on the basis of consensus or unanimity, even, and there is always one out of 28 who will say no, or maybe two or three. That is not a way to be taken seriously. So, if we want to to work in the direction of a European army long term, the first step we need to do is figure out a way to come to clearer decisions. And the way to clearer decisions is, is through majority voting. Um, that would mean that a majority decides what we want to do. Would you as Germans accept you know, that we would be maybe outvoted in, in <laughs> Brussels? Uh, I think that's what we would have to do if we want to be taken seriously. But it's a tough question for people who think that their own national sovereignty is, is, is such a key of such great importance. Sorry for being so long, but this is important. Can I say one word about Crimea? Yes. You know, uh, sir, what you, what you, I hope you don't overlook the fact that um, the newly independent country of Ukraine was given an assurance by the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, signed by the Russian Federation, the, 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 the United Kingdom, uh, and the United States, that in exchange for Ukraine giving up their nuclear weapons, and they were the third strongest nuclear country in the world, uh, their borders would be guaranteed their territorial sovereignty would be guaranteed. And that is what Russia, I'm sorry to say, um, blatantly violated. And I don't see why, how anyone could argue that the West provoked that. Uh, there was not a single warship of the West anywhere. A second round of questions. There was one question right there. Let's begin there. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Michel Morgenstern. First of all, I like you. Uh, I like to thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. And I'm having a question about China, about today's role of China, because I grew up during the Cold War, and for me it was always like this: that Russia or the West and the East had figured out their relationship. It was like a marriage. So it was very unlikely that we would kill each other. And um, this is why, in the end, because they were the only superpowers around, they maybe said, now we can afford to have less weapons. We are the only superpowers around anyway. And now, there's China. I mean, China is increasing their military arsenal under the new president very heavily. They are reconstructing, restructuring their army, and maybe now the United States and Russia, they recognized all these treaties we have made are now handicapping us to balance China. So maybe, and you have said this, Mr. Mailolo, that um, the missiles cannot carry nuclear warheads, they also can carry conventional warheads. And 
maybe now they need them or want to have them to keep China in balance or to check them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. A second question? Yes, sir. Right here in the middle. Ja, mein Name ist Freudenthal. Ähm, ich habe Sie hoffentlich richtig verstanden, dass Sie sagten, äh, Europa, Südeuropa speziell leidet unter den Problemen in Nahost, also Syrien, Afghanistan, Irak und äh, die Italiener mehr unter den libyschen Problemen. Können Sie es entschuldigen, Sie, wenn ich Ihnen das Wort falle, das Mikrofon etwas näher nehmen? Wir können Sie und, schwer hören hier ähm, auf der Bühne. Danke. Insofern hat Trump eine gewisse Berechtigung, wenn er sagt, ihr mit euren Problemen da in Europa, nun zahlt man ein bisschen mehr für die Lösung. Wenn ich die Presse nicht völlig falsch verstanden habe, dann waren die USA aber diejenigen, die im Nahen Osten äh, die Verhältnisse neu ordnen wollten, das sagte, glaube ich, Bush, und sie haben entsprechende völkerrechtswidrige Kriege geführt, sowohl in Afghanistan auch, als auch im Irak. Und auch die hochgelobte Frau Clinton war sehr für den Einsatz in Libyen, wo die NATO einen Sicherheitsbeschluss nach eigenem Gusto dann uminterpretiert hat. Und insofern ist es doch ein Zynismus, wenn Sie sagen, dass Trump recht hat, wenn er sagt, ihr Europäer zahlt mal mehr für die Lösung eurer Probleme. Okay. A third and final question. Back there, yes. I'm sorry, rather a short one. Uh, Mr. Maiolo, when you started uh, answering the first questions, uh, you introduced a cliffhanger in saying that uh, what you said was true for, the, for most arms, arms races, but with one exception. Could you resolve this, please? Yeah, the, um, the 1930s, the origins of the Second World War. Hitler came to power uh, um, with respect to uh, a plan, um, I mean, there's a huge debate about blueprints and all that, but let's just put that aside. But he certainly wanted a, a great war in Europe. That was a premise uh, he came to power with. The thing I always point out is he, he planned for one 1942-43 and one that Germany would win. That's, so the, the, the paradoxes or the, the puzzle there is why do you get a war in 1939 that, uh, uh, um, frankly, his own military advisors told him, you're going to lose it. It's going to end up with the destruction of Germany. Well, the, the answer to that question is the arms race. Because by 1938-39, I think he understood, and certainly all of anybody around him who understood uh, what was going on, was that Germany was losing the arms race. Typically, the 1930s is framed as um, the fascist powers arming and the uh, liberal democracies failing to arm. But this is a fable. And it's a fable that was told through the Cold War and justified a lot of the Cold War arming. And by the way, it's mirrored on the, it was mirrored on the Soviet side. They also understood that you know, we were suffered a surprise attack in 1941 and we didn't arm quickly enough and see Germany as an enemy. The truth is, is that both the Soviet, the Soviet Union and Britain and France devoted sufficient resources to arming early enough to outarm Germany. It was the fact that Germany, Italy, and Japan were losing their arms races that expanded the war between 1938 and 41. So that's, so I hope that takes you off the cliff edge. <laughs> <laughs> and now the first two questions, China yeah. and the cynicism concerning the USA. Um, so, are these, I, I, may not have mis, I may have misunderstood your question, but is, if your argument is that these weapons are potentially useful to balance China, I would argue that they're absolutely not useful. In fact, a lot of the national security people who are quite pro-American supremacy would argue that ground-based medium-range missiles deployed in East Asia, American ones, are not useful. What, I mean, Imagine how controversial it would be to deploy these weapons here in Germany or in Poland. Well, the Japanese? I mean, they're not, they're not going to, you know, Japanese people, I don't think, would accept nuclear weapons. So where are you going to put them? Guam? Well, Guam is already a target. I mean, if you want to just ensure that it's the first thing that's hit in any war, just put a few ground... Uh, all the missiles they need 
to fight China are based on, in, on at sea or, in the, and, or could be delivered from the air. The danger is that uh, uh, um, South Korea might take those weapons. Uh, and again, what does that do to the dynamic between North Korea and South Korea and the larger mm. regional dynamic? That's, that's extremely dangerous. Um, I did begin by saying that one way of saving the INF, because the, the, the text, the 87 text, shouldn't be seen as sacred. What should be seen as sacred is the process and the renewal of, of arms um, limitation, arms uh, um, control. The, 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 the dilemma for China, trying to bring China into uh, uh, an INF type framework is what, what were you gonna offer them in exchange for giving up that category of weapons when actually that's a prime part of their arsenal. They don't need very many intercontinental ballistic missiles. They need the intermediate ones for their defense. So that's, that's actually a really difficult part of that. I don't have an answer to that. And frankly, a lot of the people who, who, who are deep into this stuff don't have an answer. And I've now forgotten the third question. I guess that was more to Wolfgang anyway about, um, sure. because you said it, um, you, men you mentioned the USA and their claim that Europe should really take care of itself. Do you want to start with that? Uh, yeah, Isn't absolutely. it cynical to, to, you go ahead. Yeah, um, but let me just underline and, and totally agree with uh, what was just said on the, uh, on the China issue. Uh, I would really agree that the idea of needing to walk, the American claim that we need to walk away from this treaty because we might need land-based weapons in the Asian theater doesn't make a lot of sense for exactly these reasons. I just want to add one additional reason. If the United States is really serious, and I hope the White House is serious about trying to denuclearize North Korea, the best way of upsetting this process is by introducing new and additional nuclear weapons into Asia that could conceivably hit even North Korea if they are 4,000 kilometers or so. Um, so this is not a good idea. And uh, uh, there may be other reasons for the United States to walk away from uh, the INF Treaty, but the China argument is not one that convinces me. Um, on the, let me also clarify one thing which was asked earlier. Um, you should not believe, because it would be factually incorrect, that the uh, Trump administration has threatened to walk away from the INF Treaty and to deploy new nuclear weapons in Europe. No one that I know in the Trump administration has even hinted at that. They, want, they are considering to step away from the treaty because they believe that Russia has consistently violated that treaty. And a treaty that's not being respected is, of course, not a good treaty. In, so, in, in that sense, the Americans have a point, and it needs to be clarified mm -hmm. whether these violations can be corrected and whether the treaty can be saved. But it, it, is, it would be untrue to uh, consider that there is already an existing plan for the United States to introduce new land-based weapons into Europe. Uh, I've not heard that from anyone. Um, and the question would be, what would we have to defend against the already now existing Russian nuclear weapons, short-range nuclear weapons stationed in places like, you know, Königsberg, Kaliningrad? Uh, these weapons can maybe not reach Paris, but they can surely hit Berlin. Um, so, uh, in terms of strategic thinking, our question should not only be, what are the ugly plans of the Trump administration? Um, that may be a reasonable question. Um, but our question also needs to be, what, if anything, should we have, do we need, we in Europe, to make sure that we are not threatened in, an, in a way that we can't balance by uh, uh, a Russian capacity for which we have nothing to match. And that is a serious problem. So it's, things are really uh, quite complicated. Finally, on the question of you know, what should Europe do, 
I think the uh, European capacity to defend its own interests politically and, if the need arises, militarily, is totally underdeveloped, not only because we can't get our act together in terms of making political decisions, but look, in the case of Syria, and you can, uh, you know, we can have long discussions whether the, the, the war in Syria was originally caused by wrong wars conducted by the United States, but that's, you know, that, that happened 10, 15 uh, years ago. The question is, what should we do now? And we have had now a war for seven years in Syria. And Europe, including Germany, has, has had the responsibility to bear a lot of the cost, the political cost. We have a million refugees, we have political upheaval in our country, we have a chancellor who is going to lose her job, uh, essentially because of this. Yeah. So, were we capable, or should we be capable, to play a role in the conduct of the Syrian war? We have, we have not even had a place at the table, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's a total declaration of European bankruptcy. Four years ago, I wrote a piece, not in your, but uh, in Focus. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Uh, no need to. <laughs> and I said, why can't, why can't uh, the European Union get its act together and invite the warfighting parties, you know, the Iranians and the Saudis and the Qataris and the Syrians and everybody else, to a peace conference and, and declare that we will only stand up from this table when some kind of ceasefire is arranged. And some of my fellow experts were laughing at me and said, it's totally impossible, it can't happen. Well, three months later, Sergei Lavrov and John Kerry, the American and the Russian foreign ministers, started exactly this initiative. In other words, we Europeans, 500 million Europeans, left the initiative to the old you know, Cold War superpowers as if we are still totally incapable of defending our interests. Lamage, <laughs> bankruptcy. <laughs> so let's get our act together. And, and quite frankly, my, my own professional experience tells me that if you want to make a difference in these types of cases, you can do it with smart diplomacy. But if you can't back up your smart diplomacy with a little bit of military capability, then your smart diplomacy ends up being interpreted as just a little bit of hot air. Mm -hmm. And it will have not much meaning. We are still, unfortunately, living in a world where, at the end of the day, the ability to threaten the use of military force does make a difference. I'm sorry to say that, but it's the truth. It's the rea reality. And if we, if we close our eyes to this, then we shouldn't complain that we have no influence. We need to be more capable as Europeans. The New York Times has a wonderful um, interview section in each uh, weekend edition, which is called By the Book, there the New York Times asks um, fiction and non-fiction write, uh, writers about writing and the process of, of um, editing books. And one question always is, which book would you like the president to read? Which, which book would you recommend, if you could? Uh, if I was ever asked by the New York Times, I'd say uh, President Trump should read uh, Welt in Gefahr by Wolfgang Ischinger, <laughs> which ju just came out. It's, uh, and I want to... <laughs> <laughs> and I want to recommend that book, not only because it's... Um, It draws from 40, 40 years of uh, experience in foreign policy. It's also really about today's issues and the future's issues. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank the uh, um, Kerber Foundation for their hospitality. Joe Maiolo, Wolfgang Eschinger, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.